The Evolution of Modesty, Part 3 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 3. It is impossible to contemplate this series of phenomena, so radically persistent, whatever its changes of form, and so constant throughout every day of civilization, without feeling that, although modesty cannot properly be called an instinct, there must be some psychological basis to support it. Undoubtedly, such a basis is formed by that vasomotor mechanism of which the most obvious outward sign is, in human beings, the blush all the allied emotional forms of fear shame bashfulness timidity are to some extent upheld by this mechanism but such is especially the case with the emotion we are now concerned with the blush is the sanction of modesty the blush is indeed only a part almost perhaps an accidental part of the organic turmoil with which it is associated partridge who has studied the phenomena of blushing in one hundred and twenty cases pedagogical seminary april eighteen ninety seven finds that the following are the general symptoms tremors near the wrist weakness in the limbs pressure trembling warmth weight or beating in the chest, warm wave from feet upward, quivering of heart, stoppage, and then rapid beating of heart, coldness all over, followed by heat, dizziness, tingling of the toes and fingers, numbness, something rising in the throat, smarting of the eyes, singing in ears, prickling sensations of face, and pressure inside head. Partridge considers that the disturbance is primarily central, a change in the cerebral circulation, and that the actual redness of the surface comes late in the nerve storm and is really but a small part of it. There has been some discussion as to why, and indeed how far blushing is confined to the face. Henle, Uber das Erothen, thought that we blush in the face because all nervous phenomena produced by mental stages appear first in the face owing to the anatomical arrangement of the nerves of the body. Darwin, expression of the emotions, argued that attention to a part tends to produce capillary activity in the part, and the face has been the chief object of attention. It has also been argued on the other hand that the blush is the vestigial remains of a general erythism of sex in which shame originated that the blush was thus once more widely diffused and is so still among the women of some lower races its limitation to the face being due to sexual selection and the enhanced beauty thus achieved fair once had occasion to examine when completely nude a boy of thirteen whose sexual organs were deformed when accused of masturbation he became covered by a blush which spread uniformly over his face neck body and limbs before and behind except only the hands and feet fair asks whether such a universal blush is more common than we imagine or whether the state of nudity favors its manifestation. Comtes Rendus Societe de Biologie, April 1st, 1905. It may be added that Partridge mentions one case in which the hands blushed. The sexual relationships of blushing are unquestionable. It occurs chiefly in women. It aims its chief intensity at puberty and during adolescence. Its most common occasion is some more or less sexual suggestion. Among 162 occasions of blushing enumerated by Partridge, by far the most frequent cause was teasing, usually about the other sex. An erection it has been said, is a blushing of the penis. 
Stanley Hall seems to suggest that the sexual blush is a vicarious genital flushing of blood diverted from the genital sphere by an inhibition of fear just as in girls giggling is also very frequently a vicarious outlet of shame the sexual blush would thus be the outcome of ancestral sex fear it is an irritation of sexual erethism that the blush may contain an element of pleasure block remarks that the blush is sexual because reddening of the face as well as of the genitals is an accomplishment of sexual emotion betrage the etologie de psychopathia sexualis till second page thirty nine do you not think a correspondent writes that the sexual blush at least really represents a vaso relaxer effect quite the same as erection the embarrassment which arises is due to a perception under circumstances which are felt to be unsuited for such a condition there may arise the fear of awakening discussed by the exhibition of a state which is out of place i have noticed that such a blush is produced when a sufficiently young and susceptible woman is pumped full of compliments this blush seems accompanied by pleasure which does not always change to fear or disgust but is felt to be attractive when discomfort arises most women say that they feel this because it looks as if they had no control over themselves when they feel that there is no need for control they no longer feel fear and the relaxer effect has a wider field of operation producing a general rosiness erection of spinal sexual organs etc such a blush would thus be a partial sexual equivalent and allow of the inhibition of other sexual effects through the warning it gives and the fear aroused as well as being in itself a slight outlet of relaxer energy when the relationships of the persons concerned allow freedom to the special sexual stimuli as in marriage blushing does not occur so often and when it does it has not so often the consequent of fear there can be no doubt that the blush is sexually attractive the blush is the expression of an impulse to concealment and flight which tends automatically to arouse in the beholder the corresponding impulse of pursuit so that the central situation of courtship is at once presented women are more or less conscious of this as well as men and this recognition is an added source of embarrassment when it cannot become a source of pleasure the ancient use of rouge testifies to the beauty of the blush and darwin stated that in turkish slave markets the girls who readily blushed fetched the highest prices to evoke a blush even by producing embarrassment is very commonly a cause of masculine gratification savages both men and women blush even beneath a dusky skin for the phenomenon of blushing among different races see weight anthropologie de nature bd one pages one forty nine to one fifty and it is possible that natural selection as well as sexual selection has been favorable to the development of the blush it is scarcely an accident that as has been often observed criminals or the antisocial element of the community whether by the habits of their lives or by congenital abnormality blush less easily than normal persons kroner das koperlich geffel eighteen eighty seven page one thirty remarks the origin of a specific connection between shame and blushing is the work of a social selection it is certainly an immediate advantage for a man not to blush indirectly however it is a disadvantage because in many ways he will be known as shameless and on that account as a rule he will be shut out from propagation this social selection will be specially exercised on the female sex and on this account women blush to a greater extent and more readily than men 
the importance of the blush and the emotional confusion behind it as the sanction of modesty is shown by the significant fact that by lulling emotional confusion it is possible to inhibit the sense of modesty in other words we are here in the presence of a fear to a large extent a sex fear impelling to concealment and dreading self-attention this fear naturally disappears even though its ostensible cause remains when it becomes apparent that there is no reason for fear that is the reason why nakedness in itself has nothing to do with modesty or immodesty it is the conditions under which the nakedness occurs which determine whether or not modesty will be aroused if none of the factors of modesty are violated if no embarrassing self-attention is excited if there is a consciousness of perfect propriety alike in the subject and in the spectator nakedness is entirely compatible with the most scrupulous to modesty a duval a pupil of ingress tells that a female model was once quietly posing, completely nude, at the École des Beaux Art. Suddenly, she screamed and ran to cover herself with her garments. She had seen a workman on the roof gazing inquisitively at her through a skylight. And Paolo Lombroso describes how a lady, a, diplomat a diplomatist's wife, who went to a gathering where she found herself the only woman in evening dress, felt to her own surprise such sudden shame that she could not keep back her tears. It thus comes about that the emotion of modesty necessarily depends on the feelings of the people around. The absence of the emotion by no means signifies immodesty provided that the reactions of modesty are at once in motion under the stress of a spectator's eye that is seen to be lustful inquisitive or reproachful that is proved to be the case among primitive peoples everywhere the japanese woman naked as in daily life she sometimes is remains unconcerned because she excites no disagreeable attention but the inquisitive and unmannerly european's eyes at once causes her to feel confusion strats a physician and one moreover who had long lived among the japanese who frequently go naked found that naked japanese women felt no embarrassment in his presence it is doubtless as a cloak to the blush that we must explain the curious influence of darkness in restraining the manifestations of modesty as many lovers have discovered and as we may notice in our cities after dark the influence of darkness in inhibiting modesty is a very ancient observation burton in the anatomy of melancholy quotes from dandinus the saying nox facit impudentus directly associating this with blushing and bargagli the sienese novelist wrote in the sixteenth century that it is commonly said of women that they will do in the dark what they would not do in the light <clears throat> it is true that the immodesty of a large city at night is to some extent explained by the eruption of prostitutes at that time Prostitutes, being habitually nearer to the threshold of immodesty, are more markedly affected by this influence. But it is an influence to which the most modest women are, at all events in some degree, susceptible. It has, indeed, been said that a woman is always more her real self in the dark than in the glare of daylight. That is part of what chamberlain calls her night inspiration traces of the night inspiration of the influence of the primitive fire group abound in woman indeed it may be said the life of southern europe and of american society of today illustrates this point abundantly that she is in a sense a night being for the activity physical and moral of modern women revealed example in the dance and the nocturnal intellectualities of society in this direction is remarkable 
perhaps we may style a good deal of her ordinary day labor as rest or the commonplaces and banalities of her existence uh, her evening and night life being the true side of her activities a f chamberlain work and rest popular science monthly march nineteen o two geisler who has studied the general influence of darkness on human psychic life reaches conclusions which harmonize with these c m geisler der einfluss der dunkelheit auf das seelenleben des menschen weitelschaftsrisch ver weitelschaftsrisch philosophie nineteen o four pages two fifty five to two seventy nine i have not been able to see geisler's paper but according to a summary of it he comes to the result that in the dark the soul's activities are nearer to its motor pole than to its sensitive pole and that there is a tendency for phenomena belonging to the early period of development to be prominent motor memory functioning more than representative memory attention more than a perception imagination more than logical thinking egoistic force more than altruistic morals it is curious to note that short-sightedness naturally though illogically tends to exert the same influence as darkness in this respect i am assured by short-sighted persons of both sexes that they are much more liable to the emotions of shyness and modesty with their glasses than without them such persons with difficulty realize that they are not so dim to others as others are to them to be in the company of a blind person seems also to be a protection against shyness it is interesting to learn that congenitally blind children are as sensitive to appearances as normal children and blush as readily this would seem to be due to the fact that the habitually blind have permanently adjusted their mental focus to that of normal persons and react in the same manner as normal persons blindness is not for them as it is for the short-sighted without their glasses a temporary and relative almost unconscious refuge from clear vision it is of course not as the mere cloak of a possible blush that darkness gives courage it is because it lulls detailed self-realization such conscious self-realization being always a force of fears and the blush their definite symbol and visible climax it is to the blush that we must attribute a curious complementary relationship between the face and the sacro-pubic region as centers of anatomical modesty the women of some african tribes who go naked m n bay remarked cover the face with the hand under the influence of modesty martial law long since observed l i b three sixty eight that when an innocent girl looks at the penis she gazes through her fingers where as among many mohammedan peoples the face is the chief focus of modesty the exposure of the rest of the body including sometimes even the sacropubic region and certainly the legs and thighs often become a matter of indifference the concealment of the face is more than a convention it has a psychological basis we may observe among ourselves the well-marked feminine tendency to hide the face in order to cloak a possible blush and to hide the eyes as a method of lulling self-consciousness a method fabulously attributed to the ostrich with the same end of concealment a woman who is shy with her lover will sometimes experience little or no difficulty in showing any part of her person provided she may cover her face when in gynecological practice examination of the sexual organs is necessary women frequently find evident satisfaction in concealing the face with the hands although 
not the slightest attention is being directed towards the face and when an unsophisticated woman is betrayed into a confession which affects her modesty she is apt to turn her back to her interlocutor when the face of woman is covered it has been said her heart is bared and the catholic church has recognized this psychological truth by arranging that in the confessional the penitent's face shall not be visible the gay and innocent freedom of southern women during carnival is due not entirely to the permitted license of the season or the concealment of identity but to the mask that hides the face england during queen elizabeth's reign and at the restoration it was possible for respectable women to be present at the theatre even during the performance of the most free-spoken plays because they wore masks the fan has often observed a similar end all such facts serve to show that though the form of modesty may change it is yet a very radical constituent of human nature in all stages of civilization and that it is to a large extent maintained by the mechanism of blushing end of evolution of modesty part three read by john thomas coos www.validateyourlife.com the evolution of modesty part four of studies in the psychology of sex Volume 1 by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 4. We have seen that the factors of modesty are numerous. To attempt to explain modesty by dismissing it as merely an example of psychic paralysis, of staying, is to elude the problem by the statement of what is little more than a truism. Modesty is a complexus of emotions, with their concomitant ideas which we must unravel to comprehend. We have found among the factors of modesty, one, the primitive animal gesture of sexual refusal on the part of the female, when she is not at that moment of her generative life at which she desires the male's advances. Two, the fear of arousing disgust, a fear primarily due to the close proximity of the sexual center to the points of exit of those excretions which are useless and unpleasant, even in many cases to animals. 3. The fear of the magic influence of sexual phenomena, and the ceremonial and ritual practices primarily based on this fear, and ultimately passing into simple rules of decorum, which are signs and guardians of modesty. 4. The development of ornament and clothing, concomitantly fostering alike the modesty which represses male sexual desire and the coquetry which seeks to allure it. 5. The conception of women as property, imparting a new and powerful sanction to an emotion already based on more natural and primitive facts. It must always be remembered that these factors do not usually occur separately. Very often they are all of them implied in a single impulse of modesty. We unravel the cord in order to investigate its construction, but in real life the strands are more or less indistinguishably twisted together. It may still be asked finally whether on the whole modesty really becomes a more prominent emotion as civilization advances. I do not think this position can be maintained. It is a great mistake, as we have seen, to suppose that in becoming extended modesty also becomes intensified. On the contrary, this very extension is a sign of weakness. Among savages, modesty is far more radical and invincible than among the civilized. Of the Oricanian women of Chile, Trutler has remarked that they are distinctly more modest than the Christian white population, and such observations might be indefinitely extended. It is, as we have already noted, in a new and crude civilization, eager to mark its separation from a barbarism, it has yet scarcely escaped, that we find an extravagant and fantastic anxiety to extend the limits of modesty in life and art and literature. In older and more mature civilizations, in classical antiquity, in old Japan, in France, modesty, while still a very real influence, becomes a much less predominant and all-pervading influence. In life it becomes subservient to human use, in art to beauty, 
in literature to expression. Among ourselves we may note that modesty is a much more invincible motive among the lower social classes than among the more cultivated classes. This is so even when we should expect the influence of occupation to induce familiarity. Thus I have been told of a ballet girl who thinks it immodest to bathe in the fashion customary at the seaside and cannot make up her mind to do so, but she appears on the stage every night in tights as a matter of course, while Fanny Kemble, in her reminiscences, tells of an actress accustomed to appear in tights who died a martyr to modesty rather than allow a surgeon to see her inflamed knee. Modesty is, indeed, a part of self-respect, but in the fully developed human being, self-respect itself holds in check any excessive modesty. We must remember, moreover, that there are more definite grounds for the subordination of modesty with the development of civilization. We have seen that the factors of modesty are many, and that most of them are based on emotions which make little urgent appeal save to races in a savage or barbarous condition. Thus disgust, as Richet has truly pointed out, necessarily decreases as knowledge increases. As we analyze and understand our experiences better, so they cause us less disgust. A rotten egg is disgusting, but the chemist feels no disgust toward sulfuretted hydrogen, while a solution of propylamin does not produce the disgusting impression of that human physical uncleanliness of which it is an odorous constituent. As disgust becomes analyzed, and as self-respect tends to increased physical purity, so the factor of disgust in modesty is minimized. The factor of ceremonial uncleanness, again, which plays so urgent a part in modesty at certain stages of culture, is today without influence except in so far as it survives in etiquette. In the same way, the social-economic factor of modesty based on the conception of women as property, belongs to a stage of human development which is wholly alien to an advanced civilization. Even the most fundamental impulse of all, the gesture of sexual refusal, is normally only imperative among animals and savages. Thus civilization tends to subordinate, if not to minimize, modesty, to render it a grace of life rather than a fundamental social law of life. But an essential grace of life it still remains, and whatever delicate variations it may assume, we can scarcely conceive of its disappearance. In the art of love, however, it is more than a grace. It must always be fundamental. Modesty is not indeed the last word of love, but it is the necessary foundation for all love's most exquisite audacities. The foundation which alone gives worth and sweetness to what St. Encore calls its delicious impudence. Without modesty we could not have, nor rightly value at its true worth, that bold and pure candor, which is at once the final revelation of love and the seal of its sincerity. Even Ho and Emser, who argues that for the perfect man there could be no shame, because shame rests on an inner conflict in one's own personality, and the perfect man knows no inner conflict, believes that since humanity is imperfect, modesty possesses a high and indeed symptomatic value, for its presence shows that according to the measure of a man's ideal personality, his valuations are established. Dugas goes further and asserts that the ideals of modesty develop with human development and forever take on new and finer forms. There is, he declares, a very close relationship between naturalness or sincerity and modesty, for in love naturalness is the ideal attained, and modesty is only the fear of coming short of that ideal. Naturalness is the sign and the test of perfect love. It is the sign of it, for when love can show itself natural and true, one may conclude that it is purified of its unavowable imperfections or defects, of its alloy of wretched and petty passions, its grossness, its chimerical notions, that it has become strong and healthy and vigorous. It is the ordeal of it, for to show itself natural, to be always true, without shrinking, it must have all the lovable qualities, and have them without seeking as a second nature. What we call natural is indeed really acquired. It is the gift of a physical and moral evolution, which it is precisely the object of modesty to keep. Modesty is the feeling of the true, that is to say, of the healthy in love. It long exists as a vision, not yet attained, vague yet sufficiently clear for all that deviates from it to be repelled as offensive and painful. At first, a remote and seemingly inaccessible ideal 
as it comes nearer it grows human and individual and emerges from the region of dream ceasing not to be loved as ideal even when it is possessed as real at first sight it seems paradoxical to define modesty as an aspiration towards truth and love it seems on the contrary to be an altogether factitious feeling but to simplify the problem we have to suppose modesty reduced to its normal functions disengaged from its superstitions its variegated customs and prejudices the true modesty of simple and healthy natures as far removed from prudery as from immodesty and what we term the natural or the true in love is the singular mingling of two forms of imaginations wrongly supposed to be incompatible ideal aspiration and the sense for the realities of life thus defined modesty not only repudiates that cold and dissolving criticism which deprives love of all poetry and prepares the way for a brutal realism it also excludes that light and detached imagination which floats above love the mere idealism of heroic sentiments which cherishes poetic illusions and passes without seeing it the love that is real and alive true modesty implies a love not addressed to the heroes of vain romances but to living people with their feet on the earth but on the other hand modesty is the respect of love if it is not shocked by its physical necessities if it accepts physiological and psychological conditions it also maintains the ideal of those moral proprieties outside of which for all of us love cannot be enjoyed when love is really felt and not vainly imagined modesty is the requirement of an ideal of dignity conceived as the very condition of that love separate modesty from love that is from love which is not floating in the air but crystallized around a real person and its psychological reality its poignant and tragic character disappears dugas la poudre revue philosophique november 1903 so conceived modesty becomes a virtue almost identical with the roman modestia end of the evolution of modesty part 4